I just want to want to open in prayer. God, you are so good. You're so good towards us, Lord. God, you you want nothing less than the best for us. And that's you, Jesus. And God, I just I just come before you tonight, God, and I just thank you for speaking to me, Lord God, for wanting to use me, Lord, to speak to your people. So I just pray, God, that it would be you, all of you and none of me that would come forth tonight, God, even if you want to change the whole thing right now, God, you can have your way, Lord, because it's you, Lord, that the world needs, not me. God, so I just humble myself at your feet and ask that you would fill my mouth. I plead the blood of Jesus over my mind, God, that only your thoughts would enter in, Lord God, that you would direct my thoughts, God, and and my words, Lord, and that every person listening, Holy Spirit, you would penetrate them to their innermost being with your word tonight, Lord God, and let them know that you're speaking right to them individually, Lord God, you only you are able to do that work, and I ask that you would have your way. Soften hearts tonight and embolden us to be your people. In Jesus' name, amen. I titled this, Be Still and Rise Up. It'll make sense as we go through it. But um, I want to open with Psalms 46.10. Psalm 46.10. Okay, we're on pause. Thank you for your patience. The technical difficulties have been worked out. Um, So, we are going to begin um, in Psalms 46.10. The title of this message is Be Still and Rise Up. And again, God, I just ask that you would have your way tonight. And you would speak through me, Lord. All of you and none of me, Lord Jesus. Okay, so Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. I wrote down, God is calling out for us to cease striving for our own gain and to still ourselves and allow him to reveal himself to us so that through us he can once again be exalted in this world, in this nation. How many times do I get so caught up in myself that I totally miss out on being used by him for his glory? It's time to let him be exalted through us as his church. I loved the message on Sunday that Pastor Alice gave, and at the end of it, she was talking about how God has the church in a timeout right now. And I just, I really grabbed a hold of that word because um, it is so true. Right now the church is in a timeout, but that doesn't mean we're in a break. We're not, right when, when churches were shut down and we aren't, allowed to gather, which I totally understand, I totally get, and I respect our government authority for that because I know it's important at this time. But I just knew and I just felt my spirit like God was saying, the church can't fall asleep right now. Even though we're not able to get together, even though we're not able to meet with one another, we need to to take a break. We don't need to take a break. We need to actually press in more to our Lord than ever before. Is it working right now? Oh no, the duct tape came undone. Okay. 
Thank you, Lord. Pray you would work it all out in the name of Jesus. A timeout is not a break, but it is a time of reflection. That's what God spoke to me. This is a time of reflection. I think of my little Aria, who's two and a half, almost two and a half. Um, we give her timeouts because we have to. Um, God disciplines those who he loves, and we're setting that example to her as her parents. But, but when we give her a timeout, it's because she is not doing what she was asked to do. She's not fully fully being obedient to what is being asked of her, what she knows is right. Um, so we tell her, you know, hey, you're going to go into your room, you're going to sit and have a time out, or wherever we're at, a church even, we give her a time out, and we say, we want you to sit there and think about what you did wrong, and, and we remind her, this is what we want you to do. You can sit there until you calm down, have time to reflect, time to, to understand that she needs to be repentant and get up and do what is right. Um, I think about even another comparison, um, for you sports people. I'm not really a sports person, but I know enough to be able to talk about this, but a timeout in sports I wrote down is sometimes called when the players of the team are struggling and need a refresher on the game plan or need a new game plan so they can hopefully win the game. That is where we're at. Right now, I truly believe it for the church. We're in a timeout, a time where God's saying, I want you to reflect and think about um, what I've called the church, my bride, to be doing and what you're not doing so that you can be repentant individually and collectively as the body of Christ and get back up and start doing what is right. Get into my game plan and, um, and do it right. And I know I just, I want to take a moment and just honor our pastors and our leadership in this church because during a time like this, it is such a blessing, first and foremost, to be able to go to our God and just have his, be under his peace, under his covering, but to know that we have godly leadership who are truly following after God's heart and want what's best for the body, for the people they're shepherding. And I just thank them for that. But this is... Um, this is for the body of Christ as a whole, and each of us personally, individually. Um, I just, I was on a run the other day, and I run on the treadmill at home, and Joel's in my room, and there's this little spot on the wall right in front of me that I can stare at and keep my focus on so I'm not staring at the time on the treadmill wondering how much longer I have and I'm, not, I'm never going to make it because I'm only five minutes in. So I stare at this spot on the wall and, and God shifted because I talk to the Lord when I'm on my runs. But I, he shifted my focus and our, our walls have like this bumpy pattern, makes little different pictures, patterns, and I looked over and it looked like he was outlining an hourglass, and I felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me, you are running, we are running out of time. And that same day, this was just like a week ago, um, I was listening to a message, I can't even remember who it was by, but the one, the one thing out of the whole message I remember is he was quoting somebody from a movie, and, and he said, we are burning daylight. Time is running out, we are burning daylight. And I felt like God was saying, my bride, my church, you, he, he's calling out to us right now. You're in a time of reflection. Are, are you reflecting? Are you taking that time out seriously? Or are you just sitting there in a huff wondering why, why everything's going on around you, why I haven't lifted this virus yet, why I haven't allowed you to go back to church or work or whatever? Are you sitting there just so concerned and reflecting on yourself? Are you reflecting on what you need to do to be in a complete and total alignment with me again. Um, I wrote down, a timeout only lasts so long, and God willing, we have learned our lesson in that time and have figured out that if we want to win, we need to be fully obedient to what is being asked of us from our Heavenly Father. Otherwise, next time, the consequence will be more severe, and we will continue to suffer losses. Just like if Arya doesn't really understand by the end of her time out that she has done something wrong, needs to repent and now do what is right. Or if a sports team doesn't get the new game plan through their head, 
or thinks there's a better way and they end up not following through with the new game plan well, they lose the game. How many more losses are we going to take to the enemy before we get it through our heads that we need to stick to God's game plan alone? I wrote down, uh, God has put the church in a timeout because we have not fully followed through with his game plan in our nation. And because of that, the soul of our nation is at stake. I truly believe that... that the church doesn't have many, if any, timeouts left to get it right. Are we going to follow through with God's game plan and what he's asking of, of us to do through his word every day for the rest of our lives? Or are we going to continue with our own game plan? If we do things our own way or don't do anything at all, us, our nation, and our world will perish. I was listening uh, to a message on YouTube a few days ago, and he was um, talking about Jonah and the whale and how God called Jonah. He's a, Jonah was a prophet. He said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and tell the people there who were, were wicked people doing their own thing. He said, I want you to go there and tell them to repent and tell them to turn to me. That's what I want to you, want you to do. And Jonah said, no, I don't want to go to Nineveh. Um, so he decided to get on, onto a ship and go to Tarshish instead to try to run from God. But God sent a storm. And uh, the... The part of this message that really struck out, stuck out to me was that God didn't send the storm um, for any other reason except to get Jonah's attention. It was because Jonah was not doing what he was supposed to do. God sent a storm to get his attention, to wake him up. And, and Jonah understood. But the other thing, too, is God used this storm to turn the, the ship's crewmen towards him. They ended up believing in God after that. But the point of the story is that God was after Jonah, and he allowed a storm to come into Jonah's life to wake him up and to get him to realize that he needed to be obedient to what God was asking him to do. So we know the story. Jonah was thrown overboard by the crewmen, and he was swallowed by a whale. And I really believe that Jonah's time out, just like representing the body of Christ, was his time inside the whale. The three days where he prayed, and he probably had to fast while he was in there too, I'm sure. And just that time of reflection where he realized, God, I wasn't being obedient to what you wanted me to do. You had a calling on my life, and I ran the other direction, and now I'm in this time out. I'm inside this whale. And he was repentant. He wanted wanted to do what God wanted him to do. So God had him spit out of the whale onto dry land, and he went to Nineveh and followed through with God, what God called him to do, and the people of Nineveh repented and turned to God. Praise God. Jonah was obedient. Just a picture of the church right now. We are called by God. We have a high calling on us because it's his spirit that is within us. It's his spirit that's within us, and we are to set the standard over this nation, over our own lives, over this world as the body of Christ of what it looks like to truly follow after God's heart and to be fully obedient to him. Otherwise, just like I said before, a a good father, he disciplines his children because he loves them. He wants them to get it right. He doesn't want them to keep stumbling and falling because it hurts us individually as well as others. Just like with our natural children, if we just let them do what they want to do, it it harms them. God knows. He says, I love you enough to discipline you. I love you enough to give you a time out where you can sit there and reflect upon what you've done that's wrong and what you need to do that is right. Um, That's my my (laughs) lead-in. 
So we'll get into the, the message, but I just wanted to give a little bit of a background of this message, what it was birthed out of. Um, a little over a week ago, I got a text from my sister-in-law, Tina, and she texted me, um, there's been this bill that was presented in our state. It's a new sexual education bill. And um, it was up for vote. It had to go through all the right, the right process and get to our governor. And we were petitioning and praying that it would not be signed. This bill is just, it is, it's horrific. Um, it's a sex ed bill for kindergartners through 12th graders, and it's um, sponsored by Planned Parenthood. And um, there's just a lot in it. I, I ended up downloading the curriculum to read through it myself so I could know for myself what exactly was going to be taught to our children in the public school system in our state. And it's actually a very similar sexual sex education that's being taught in California right now um, to kindergartners through 12th graders. And it's, it's, it was, I, I couldn't even read through all of it. It was so um, just pornographic, to be honest. It was just, just, it was horrible. They have kindergartners sit down with each other. It can be a boy and a boy or a girl and a girl or a girl and a boy. And one of them gets to be a transgender and one gets to pretend that he's uh, whatever, um, gender bending, where you get to pretend or you get to be one sex or another at any given time. You can, you can be a girl or a boy depending on how you feel from moment to moment. And this, this is in the curriculum. And they get to sit down with each other and, and do role plays and pretend they're in a sexual relationship and get to talk. I know it's graphic, but it's what is going to be taught to our kindergartners, so we should be able to talk about it in church so we can pray. Um, but they get to sit down with each other and pretend like they're in a sexual relationship and what they need to do to be able to follow through with that. And just so much more, that's probably some of the, the worst things that are in it. And they even um, are redefining gender, too, where it's not not what you're born with, not your biological sex, but who you think you are, who you feel you are. They're redefining the word that's in the dictionary. They're redefining it and teaching it in schools as the right proper definition. That gender means you can be who you feel you are, whatever sex you feel you are. So I just, I was so grieved in my spirit, I, I honestly, for a while, I just couldn't believe that, that something like that could even be presented to be passed, to be taught in our school system. But it was, and we prayed and petitioned, and I texted and, and contacted everybody I knew to petition and pray, because I just can't imagine my nephew, Sam, he's, he's in kindergarten right now. I can't imagine, I just can't imagine it. And I just uh, got this text from Tina, and she told me that our governor signed it. And so, and there were all these amendments put forth, like um, parents being able to opt their children out of the sex ed, or, or having it taught through from fifth through twelfth graders instead of kindergartners all the way up. And they passed none of those amendments. They're actually, instead of starting it in 2022 and 2023, for um, the later grades, they're going to start it this year in our school system. Across our state, thousands of children are going to be taught this, and it's a year-long class. So every day they're in class. This is why parents can't opt their children out. They have no option. Otherwise, their children will pass um, and graduate into the next grade. So... Pastor Alice, uh, I texted her about it, and she called me in tears. And it broke my heart because um, I just, it grieves me 
to think that we're at that point in our nation and that we've let it get that far to think of our little innocent children being taught things that are just absolutely horrendous and we're, we're letting it happen. I mean, I know, I don't know. I know we can do more. I know we can do more as the body of Christ. We are supposed to be the ones that are holding the standard in this nation. So that's the background. That's And, and when I was talking to Pastor Alice on the phone and, and she was praying, God, just download in, into my spirit, you need to study Esther. And that's where this, this message came from was just that moment of just grief for the soul of our very nation and what is happening in it right now. Um, so I want to go to Esther. Esther chapter 3. I'm, gonna, I'm going to be jumping around a lot in there, but just try to stay with me. I'll go slow. So Esther chapter 3. Verses 1 through 6. Esther 3, 1 through 6. It's titled, Haman's Conspiracy Against the Jews. After these things, King Xerxes promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened, when they spoke to him daily and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were, with, who were throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes, the people of Mordecai. Verses 12 through 15. Then the king's scribes were called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and a decree was written according to all that Haman commanded to the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the officials of all people, to every province according to its script, and to every people in their language. In the name of King Xerxes it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. A copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province, being published for all people, that they should be ready for that day, the couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan, the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. A study note in my Bible says the picture of the king and Haman drinking and congratulating themselves on their solution to the problem of the Jews contrasts with the disposition of the city. The impression is that the people in Susa were not in favor of the decree, nor did they share Haman's rabid anti-Semitism. Just thinking, too, with this sex ed bill, people I talked to, there was actually um, somebody I talked to who um, considers herself to be a Democrat, to be liberal, and she said, I do not support this. And she let the governor know she does not support this. There were thousands upon thousands. I talked to some of our senators. They said, we are so flooded with emails and phone calls of people who are so enraged by this bill that we can't even keep up with it. 
and they send those messages to our governor, and yet he still, still signed this bill. Um, so it just goes to show, like in Esther, the people in Susa seemed to not be in favor of this decree. They were per perplexed by it. Why, why would the king send out this de decree to annihilate this whole nation of people? It doesn't make sense. I don't understand. They were not, it seemed to be not in favor of it. And I truly believe in this nation, even non-believers are not in favor of the evil that's being poured out into our nation. Um, But we as the church are called to hold the standard. Like I've said before, we're the ones that are called to hold the standard high so that people can see the difference between what is right in God's eyes and what is wrong in God's eyes. That is our job as the church. We need to, in our daily lives and as the church as a whole, we have to hold to God's standard. We have to hold to God's standard because if we don't, this is where we end up. Even thinking about Governor Cuomo of New York lighting up the Empire State Building in pink in celebration of the new law he signed that babies, even up to the moment of birth, can be ab aborted. And I watched as he signed the bill and everybody in that room were cheering and rooting him on like it was a huge celebration. But I know outside of that building, people were perplexed. Why? You know, when you understand the logistics of what that really means, a full-term baby being able to be aborted by law, people are perplexed by that. I truly believe it, and I truly believe that if, if us as, as the church that knows the difference between right and wrong if we don't take a stand for the truth, this is going to continue. Because like our pastors say, whatever we permit will increase. It's not going to stop here. It's going to keep going. Just like I heard before with this sex ed bill, it's in our public schools right now. But that doesn't mean that it's not going to be something that homeschooler, homeschooling parents are told to teach or what private schools are be told to teach as well. So we have to hold to God's standard. I truly believe that we are, are in a time in our nation where a call has gone forth to God's people to rise up and take their rightful place. Just as Queen Esther was given a position in authority, so we too have been given a position of authority, for it is the King of kings and the Lord of lords who dwells within us. He has called us to occupy until he returns, not to sit down and let the enemy occupy as we just go on with life as usual, waiting to be taken into heaven when our time comes. What about the souls that are in desperate need of Jesus? What about all those children that are going to be taught that in their schools? We're not only called to occupy until he comes, but to push out the enemy where he has already occupied and take it back for the Lord. This begins with allowing him to every moment of every day of our lives and for him to occupy us and be Lord over us. For it is out of individual, individual lives turned wholly to the Lord, completely to the Lord, in submission to Him, that revival will begin. There's a call going out. It's a time of reflection, a time where God really wants to speak to us individually and collectively as a body. Are we, are we listening to Him? I want to go to Hag Haggai. I don't know quite how to say it. I've heard it a few different ways. Haggai, chapter 1. It's tucked away in there. It's hiding. Hold on. I 
found it. Okay. Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth, sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses, and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little, and when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens... Above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all, and on all the labor of your hands. I just believe this is where we are right now in this nation. Um... We have looked to our blessings and to our security through our government and our booming economy, but God has taken it away. This is his mercy, and this is his grace to get our eyes back on the true provider himself. We have been so blessed once again in this nation because God rose up a government leader in our nation who wants what is best for this nation. But Donald Trump and his administration are not the answer. God is. As we have heard, Donald Trump is standing with his foot in the door, holding it open to the church so we can take our rightful place and set the standard once again in this nation. Hallelujah. This is the time. God has everything under control, but he has left us in charge. And without us rising up to take our rightful place and follow his orders, his house will stay in ruins. He desires to be Lord over this nation once again, but we have to do the work. It begins with us. No more complacency or fear of opposition. We were on a, a hunt for an extra mic, and I found it. <laughs> so the study note on verse 2, it says, The people were saying to each other, The time has not come to finish the work of building God's temple. Times were tough, and there was opposition. We can make any excuse we want to not be the body of Christ. But God says, it's not going to fly with him. Study note you know, on verse 4 says, Paneled houses refer to the upper income homes of Zerubbabel and Joshua. Their homes had expensive wood interior paneling to cover the stones on the walls and ceiling, similar to Solomon's, King Solomon's palace. Why were these leaders spending lavishly on their own homes and giving no priority to building God's house. God's house was in ruins because each man was busy with his own house. Complacency. Complacency lends a false sense of security in which, in which some people trust.
God is doing a shaking right now. I wrote, are we willing to be shaken out of our false sense of security into true security in Him? We can all go a little deeper with the Lord. We can all press in more. I know some of us, we, we get it. We get it, but we can all press in. I believe for all eternity, like Pastor Dave says, we'll be learning from Him. We'll be growing in the grace and knowledge of Him. But we have to be willing to press in. I was actually, um, I don't know if everybody heard about the earthquake in Idaho about a week ago or so, the 6.5 earthquake. But I was, I was laying in bed and I was watching YouTube. I had just woken up from a nap. And um, I was scrolling through some videos and I scrolled right by one um, that was done by a guy. I've listened to his messages before. I scrolled right by it, and I felt like God said, you need to go back up to that video and watch it. So I did. And a few minutes into it, the whole bed starts to shake. And I was like, that's really weird. <laughs> and I was thinking, I'm like, that it must be the cat just running back and forth because she's only a year old. She's got a lot of spunk and energy. And so I was like, it's got to be the cat. I was, I just couldn't think of any other explanation. And so I, I ended up not finishing the video, but I got out of bed and started to make dinner. And I was in the kitchen and my mom called me. She said, did you feel that earthquake a little while ago? I said, oh my goodness, that was an earthquake. Um, and I was like, you know, I was thinking about, I'm like, the title of the video that I was watching was The Great Shaking in the Bible. I said, okay, God, I am listening. And uh, a lot of this message came out of that. I really believe that God is shaking up the body of Christ right now. Like, wake up. Wake up out of your complacency. Complacency. Wake up out of your false sense of security that you've built for yourself and enter into the plans and purposes that I have for you into what I have called you and created you to do that I may be glorified and exalted among the nations. I think God's opening up our eyes to the reality of, of the seriousness of what life looks like without him. And, and what the enemy can accomplish when we allow him to. Um, from verse 8 in Haggai chapter 1, it says, God's desire was that the people build the temple and give priority to worshiping God. Whatever one does, God should always take pleasure in it and be glorified in it. That is the standard he has over our lives individually and over the body of Christ. Whatever we do, God should always take pleasure in it and be glorified by it. And the thing is, is we, we get to know what he takes pleasure in by reading his word and getting to know him personally for ourselves and understand the standard that he has set over our lives. And the thing is, it's not, it's not like the military so much where it's, this is, you know, the only way you can do things. It's rules, rules, rules. It's a relationship with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And whatever he asks of us and requires of us is what is best for us and what we, we will truly be satisfied and fulfilled by because it's what we are created by him to do. I was listening to a, a stream of um, videos on CBN today. Different people from around the world were getting together to have communion at the same time, to prophesy, to pray, to, be, to repent for the sins of this nation and this world. It was powerful. But one girl got on there and she said, I had a vision from God, and she said, God showed me this giant construction zone, and each person had their own blueprint that they had come up with. They were building individually their own kingdoms, but they were building like toddlers do with children's toy blocks, 
and everything they built ended up being an absolute mess. Then the Holy Spirit came and blew away everyone's own blueprints, and only the cornerstone was left, our Jesus. The cornerstone had a bright light that shot out of it, and the Holy Spirit sent one blueprint down from heaven created by God himself. And every one of those people came together in unity to build from that blueprint with their eyes fixed on the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. I truly believe, just like in Haggai, where God's talking about he desires for his church, for the people that are after his heart to to get back up again, to build his house, to build his temple, to do the work that he's called us and created us to do, to set his standard once again over this nation. Just like with these blueprints, we can get so caught up in ourselves, it does, whatever it looks like. Even in church, we can get caught up in ourselves. We can get caught up in what we want to do in our vision, and it ends up causing us to become divided from the body of Christ. It causes us to enter into building our own kingdoms and God saying, enough is enough. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we could do what we wanted. He died on the cross so he could have his way in and through us with his spirit within us so that we could allow his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, let's go back to Esther. Esther chapter 4 now. Esther chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 10 through 12, but I want to give a little bit of background on it before I do. Um, So, this decree that went forth for the annihilation of all the Jews had, had gotten to Mordecai. Mordecai found out about it, and he was so grieved by it. He ended up tearing his clothes, wearing sackcloth, grieving right in front of the king's gate. And Esther saw it, and she, she sent one of her servants to go ask him what was happening. And, and he, he, um, he sent word back to her through the servant and said, you, Esther, you are queen. You can go before the king, and you can petition him to reverse this decree. And this is what Esther had to say. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king, who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. Opposition and complacency is what I wrote down. She had, there was opposition. She could die, and she knew it. It was law. She could die. But Mordecai said, I'm going to read verses 13 through 17. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. I 
I wrote down, are we willing to count the cost and be all in until we see through to a breakthrough of the enemy's ordinances being uprooted and God's ordinances being decreed once again instead? Are we willing to make a call out and fast and pray? Are we willing to go before our government officials and tell them these decrees must be stopped or overturned? Are we willing? This is for the soul of our nation as well as our own souls. The soul of the Jews were at stake, their own physical lives. Are we willing? God is not cruel, as Pastor Dave says. God is not cruel, but he is serious. He is trying desperately to get our attention. We have become so complacent. Do we not realize that we are not safe from the evil being poured out into our nation? We will not escape the effect wickedness is having on our nation. It's easy to say, it's just one drink. It's just a white lie. I don't think it's going to harm me if I don't forgive that person. I will homeschool my kids so they won't have to be taught by the public school system. Or I've never had an abortion and will never be put into a position where I'll need one or will encourage someone to get one. Let the LGBTQ community do what they want. It won't harm me. But God is saying it will. It will affect us one way or another. And what about all the people that it's affecting directly? Do we not care about their everlasting souls? Proverbs 31, 8 and 9 says, Open your mouth for the speechless and the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. Is what Pastor Dave says, not Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. But it's just, it's just saying we preach the gospel best by how we live our lives. But God does call us sometimes to speak it outwardly and boldly and confidently. Just like in Esther, Mordecai said, if you remain completely silent at this time, you and your father's house will perish. Whenever a decree goes forth that is wicked and we as the church allow it to go forth, we stay silent. We have allowed and submitted ourselves to be sold over to the enemy. Not necessarily to be used by him, to, but to be affected by his wicked ways. Unless we don't deal with that sin that is in us personally, then we are being used by the enemy. You have to let God deal with the sin that's in your life and let him expose it and remove it from your life. Because remember, this isn't just about evil laws and decrees. I believe that this is a big part of why we're in the mess we're in. But that has come about because the church hasn't taken her rightful place in this nation by first and foremost living righteous lives. Revival begins with us. The evil we are allowing to continue to seep into our nation has a far more detrimental effect than any virus ever could. This is why I know that God is desperately trying to get our attention. He wants us to shift our focus off of this virus, and he wants us to shift our focus back onto him. But it is good to ask him to rid this world of our, our virus. I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray it out. We should. But that's not the purpose behind it all. We need to remember, just as with Israel in the Old Testament, with all the pestilence, famine, and sword, that he has also allowed this virus to come into our world because he has a plan and a purpose. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Sometimes God has to send things that will shake us to get us to realize that we need his mercy and his grace. This is, this is a time, like I said before, that I really believe is a time of mercy and grace. It's a time he's trying to, to get our attention back onto him. I wrote, we keep asking him to move, for him to do something, but he's saying it's time for you to move. It's time for you to do something. 
We need to and have to, for the sake of the soul of this nation, rise up out of our complacency and do what he requires of us. Pray, fast, and seek his face, to seek him with all of our hearts. I want to go to Isaiah. Chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. Isaiah 40, 3 through 5 says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. God wants to do this through us, to prepare the way of the Lord. He's coming back again. He's coming back again. This was talking about the first time he was coming, but I believe it's talking about the second time that he's coming to. We are called to make straight in the desert a highway for our God. He's coming back. And we want every eye that sees him to run to him, to not run from him. It's our job to show people what it looks like to truly serve God and to hold to his standard. He is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle, and he's, he is giving us a shaking awakening to get our eyes back on him. And off of ourselves, he has brought us to, into uncharted territory, the wilderness, where he wants us to glorify him and show the world who he is. I want to talk about victory, what it all looks like if, if we do what God's calling us to do. Esther, Chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Now Harbanah, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows fifty cubits high which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided, because Esther had chosen to go before the king and petition him for the life of her people and her nation. And the king realized that the decree he sent forth and that Haman and him had created was not good. So Haman was hung. Um, chapter 8. So I just, I want to read just a little bit of it. But chapter 8 is about Esther petitioning the king again, saying, um, please don't let my people perish. And the king says, you and Mordecai, I want you to go and create a new decree, to write a new letter to decree to the Jews that they were permitted to protect their lives on the day previously decreed that they would be annihilated. Um, so this is what happens after that. Esther 8, 15 through 17. So Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold and a garment We on? We are. Fine linen and purple, and the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness, joy and honor. And in every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. Then many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. That is victory. That is victory. 
Will we choose to be willing to even lay down our own lives? Which, you know, church, our believers in part of the wor- other parts of the world are literally giving their lives for the sake of the gospel. And over here, we're not even being, sometimes, some people are, and thank God for them, but even willing to lose our job because we hold to God's standard, willing to be called a name, willing to die to ourselves, willing to allow God to uproot the sin in our own personal lives. It doesn't feel good, but it does afterwards, and it's worth it, because this is the victory that happens. Many of the people of the land became Jews because of the fear of the Jews fell upon them. That is what God is saying If my church is willing to take her rightful place and to count the cost no matter what, many people will come to know him. As God said that if if Jesus is lifted high, he will draw all men unto himself. I wrote down B, revival. Revival begins with us individually. If we choose to let God do the work in and through us, revival has already begun. Isn't that amazing? But we have to choose to be used by him. Matthew 26. I want to end with this. Matthew 26. Thirty six through forty five. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? I'm going to end there. Are you still sleeping and resting? I believe that's what God is saying to us. Are you still sleeping and resting? I'm going to put you in a timeout and let you reflect upon what you, what you aren't doing, how you're not being fully obedient to me. And during this time of timeout, I, I pray that we'll get it, that we'll really press into him, that will really seek his face and be willing to do whatever he asks us to do and realize that we're not always right. We, we aren't perfect, but God's spirit is within us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Without him, we can do absolutely nothing. Are we going to be willing to let him tear up the blueprints we've created to build the kingdoms that we want to build to satisfy ourselves and allow him to show us the blueprint and the plans and purposes that he has for our lives, that he has for this nation, that he has for this world, and be a part of getting to build and establish his kingdom in this world? Or are we going to keep building our own? It's our choice. But Jesus is coming back. He is coming back again. Pray the reality of that will sink into every single one of us. He's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. 
stay awake. I do want to make a call out to everyone listening. I did get the blessing from our pastors for this, too. Um, I want us to fast and to pray. It's Passover tonight until next Wednesday. And it's Easter on Sunday. And I want to make a call out for a fast, an Esther fast, starting tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, for those who can, to not eat or drink except water, and to really press into him, to be willing to die to our flesh, just like he was asking the disciples, can you not stay awake with me for one hour? Are you still sleeping? It's time for us to wake up. So if you'll fast and pray, Joel and I will be doing this. And I pray that many others will as well. This isn't, this isn't for us, it's for God. And we really want to hear his voice during this time. I believe it's an important, in a really important, vital time for us to really press in. And that, like I said before, means dying to ourselves and letting him speak to us. So if you'll fast and pray with us and to think that the fast will end on Easter. God revealed that to me after it was put in my heart. The fast will end on Easter, Resurrection Day. It's a beautiful thing, and God gets all the glory for it and all the praise. So I'm going to end. And those of you who can't fast food and water or food and uh, drink for three days, there's so many other things you can fast from, so many other things we've been told before. You can fast from social media or from, you know, whatever it is that God shows you, because he knows what is dearest to your heart. Mine is breakfast, and so I won't <laughs> get to have that for three days. And it's a blessing to be able to do. He gave his life for us. Can we not give three days? So whatever God lays on your heart to fast from, if you can't fast from food and drink, Please do it and take the time seriously and really press into him because he wants to speak to us and he wants to use us for his glory. What a blessing and an honor and a privilege to be used by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm going to pray. Lord Jesus, it is such a privilege and such an honor to get to come before you and get to talk with you. And I pray, God, that we would listen, that we would learn to listen, to be in your presence, to listen for your voice, to be willing to fast, to be willing to pray, to be willing to give of ourselves for the rest of our lives, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice unto you, Lord God a holy and acceptable sacrifice as we're covered in the blood of Jesus in right standing before you, God. We just thank you. We just thank you, Jesus, for loving us enough to put us in a timeout, for loving us enough to, to allow things even to come into our lives that'll shift our focus off of ourselves and onto you, God. We need you so desperately, God. And I pray that your bride would be found without spot or wrinkle, God. We just praise you and honor you tonight for who you are and who you desire to be through us to this world that needs, so desperately needs to see your standard lifted high. God, we give you all glory and all honor and all praise for who you are, Jesus, and for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Men, 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 men. Amen. Thank you. It's uh, been a little busy here.
with everything. If there were any glitches in what you were watching, watching tonight, I encourage you to, uh, it'll be in the archives on our website to watch it again in the next day or two because there was a real challenge here tonight and everything that worked fine until we started. And then we were looking for mics, looking for sound, looking for all this stuff. So um, watch it again in the archives and, and let it sink in. The devil shakes us to break us, and God will take the exact same shaking, and he will shake us to wake us. So the devil shakes us to break us, but God shakes us to wake us. And that's what's happening. And I want to give an opportunity, because some of you may have tuned in and not even known who we are, what we're talking about. But uh, I know at this time, a lot of people are looking around thinking, what is going on? It's around the world. And so we want to give you an opportunity tonight, if you've never done it before, to, uh, to give your heart to the Lord, to invite Jesus Christ into your life. And especially at this time, it's, that's what he died for, to give you life and give it abundantly. God said it this way a long time ago. He said, I put two doors before you, life and death. Choose life. Well, of course, a lot of us didn't know that, and we chose death initially, and that's where we are right now, wondering what's going on and where's this all in and what does it mean to me. But Jesus is the door, is what the Bible says. He's that door of life. So the thing that separates us the most is sin. Sin isn't drinking and drugging and carousing and running around. That's a result. Sin is literally missing the mark, not walking God's plan and purpose for your life. And the first thing John the Baptist said when he appeared on the scene, and the first thing Jesus said when he appeared on the scene was repent. That means turn around. It's not just I'm sorry. That starts it. But it's to turn around and literally start living and walking in the opposite direction in thought, word, and deed. And so we're going to just pray that, and I want you to pray with me tonight and make that decision in your heart to turn around, to repent, to invite Jesus into your heart. Open that door. He is the door of life. Go through that door and allow him to mold and make and change your life. And it's not just about life here. It's about eternity. And so just pray this. Father, I thank you for this message tonight or what's been said before, or the fact that I'm looking around to wonder what is going on. But Father, I just choose right now to ask you to forgive me for my sin, that I have not followed your plan and purpose for my life, whether I understood it or not, but now I know, Lord. So I choose right now, this minute, to turn around, to repent, to walk in the opposite direction. And I can only do that, Lord, if you come into my heart and into my life and become the Lord of my life, my Savior and Lord. And so I take this time right now, God, by faith, whether I understand it all or not, by faith, I choose you, Jesus, to come into my heart, into my life, be Lord of my life. Help me to walk the walk that you've planned for me, to be the person that you planned for me to be before the foundation of the world. And I thank you for that, Lord. Come into my heart and into my life and give me perspective on all of this, Lord. You came, your word says, to give me life and give it abundantly, whatever that means. And so I thank you, Lord. I make you Lord and Savior of my life, and I dedicate it to you, and I purpose, Lord, and help me to do it, to walk totally in the opposite direction to the way I've been walking, in thought and word and deed, in Jesus' name. And I rejoice, Lord, because your word says that if I do that and declare it with my mouth, then I am saved and that I'll never be disappointed. And so, Father, I thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I pray for anybody who prayed that, God, that you would just make yourself so real to them right now. And, Lord, that they would know, but even as they stepped out in faith, you will meet them at that place, God. You know how to make yourself so real to us, Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. I encourage you to tell someone about that. Ask someone about it. You can go to our website and call our phone number. You can go to our website and uh, email us. And we'd love to just talk with you, stand with you, pray with you, and encourage you. But this is a beautiful week.
to be able to look away from all the things of life and give your heart to Jesus and to walk with him and to thank him for what he did. He so loved the world. God so loved the world and so loved you and me that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting and eternal life. So we rejoice with you. Let us know if you were here, we would be able to pray with you and rejoice with you and give you a Bible, but God knows too and he's with you. So you be blessed for all of the body of Christ that have been watching, especially from Dream Center, but also anybody else who's watching. We just bless you in the name of Jesus. And uh, remember, we're live streaming the drama on Friday night at 6 p.m. And then the Sunday service, which is Resurrection Day. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, and you be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.